Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen on your iPhone, Android device, Kindle, or MP3 player. And today we'll be talking about Ornithelestes, and we have a bunch of dinosaur news. And big thanks to all of our Patreon supporters. If you want to see what we're up to over there, we are plugging away at our next goal so we can give you all stickers, then please check out our page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. First in the news, last week we talked about Spiclipius, I love that name, <laughs> a ceratopsian found in the Judith River Formation, and there's another new ceratopsian to talk about this week. From a paper titled, A New Centrosaurine Ceratopsid, Machiroceratops Chronosi, from the upper sand member of the Waweep Formation from the Middle Campanian, Southern Utah. And it was published in PLOS One and written by Eric K. Lund and others. So as we mentioned last week, Spiclipius is in the typically less ornamental Chasmosaurine group, but Machiroceratops is a centrosaurine, which means you'd usually expect more ornamentation on it. And if you're hoping for some exciting frill ornamentation, you're in luck. Oh, good. <laughs> it's estimated to be from about 80 to 77 million years ago, and it would have been about 26 feet or 8 meters long compared with 15 feet or 4.5 meters for Spiclipius. They believe it's closely related to Diabloceratops, which was found in the same formation a while ago, and more distantly related to Styracosaurus. The paleo art of Machiroceratops show it looking a lot like Diabloceratops. You might remember that Diabloceratops gets its name from the two huge horns that stick out of the top of its frill, and it also has two horns above its eyes and a really small central horn. They both have triangular frills, and Machiroceratops has a smooth frill aside from two big horns that stick out the top of its frill. So on Diabloceratops, the horns point up and then a little bit to the side, but on Machiroceratops, they point pretty much straight forward, which gives it kind of a pincher-like look between the horns on the top of its frill sticking forward and the horns above its eyes sticking up and then back a little bit. The name comes from Machiris, which is Greek for bent sword because of its awesome frill spikes, and the specific name comes from the Greek god Kronos because, quote, according to mythology, he deposed his father Uranus with a sickle or scythe, and as such is depicted carrying a curved, bladed weapon, end quote. Nice way. He <laughs> deposed his father. Yeah. That's a pretty cool origin story, and that's probably why they wanted to name it after such a neat story. And I guess those new horns that it has sticking out of the top of its frill are kind of sickle-like. So, like the title said, it was discovered in the Waweep Formation, which is in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in southern Utah, and they found the unique top of the frill, a nearly complete brain case, the two horns that were probably above the eyes, and then other bits and pieces of the skull and frill. So it's a pretty cool find. It fills in a little bit more of the Ceratopsian family tree and shows some more diversity, so it's always good to see. We love new dinosaurs. And hopefully they find more of it later, because it wasn't really a full skull. It kind of had the bits that you'd be excited to find, like the horns and the edge of the frill and the brain case. But, you know, it's missing the beak and the teeth. And It was deposed. Yeah. <laughs> We've also talked previously about the internal structure of a Kunbarasaurus, formerly known as Minmi, skull. And it had a complex airway and an inner ear that was proportionately enormous, making it more like a turtle than a dinosaur, in that way at least. <laughs> and there's a new paper titled Endocranial Morphology of the Primitive Notosaurid Dinosaur Pawpawsaurus <laughs> Campylae from the Early Cretaceous of North America. I like that name. Pawpawsaurus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's from like the Pawpaw Formation or something like that. <laughs> it was published in PLOS One, written by Ariana Paulina Carabajal, and others. 
Unlike Canbarasaurus, which is from Australia, this study looks at the internal structure of a Papasaurus, which was found in Texas in the U.S. back in 1992, and at 100 million years old, it's roughly 15 million years more recent than Canbarasaurus. Like the other study, they used CT scans to examine the interior of the skull and make inferences about its senses. In an interview with Science Daily, Paulina Karabahal said, quote, The CT scans revealed an enlarged nasal cavity compared to dinosaurs other than ankylosaurians. They may have helped Papasaurus bellow out a lower range of vocalizations, improved its sense of smell, and cooled the inflow of air to regulate the temperature of blood flowing into the brain, end quote. She also points to recent studies where the olfactory ratio is seen as a good indicator of how well an animal could smell, and Papasaurus had a pretty high olfactory ratio, which was actually pretty close to a modern crocodile, meaning that it probably relied on its sense of smell. Its sense of smell wasn't quite as good as Carcharodontosaurids or Tyrannosaurids, but probably better than just about any predator that it would have encountered. It also couldn't smell quite as well as Ankylosaurus eventually could, but that was after another 30 million years of evolution, so it's not too surprising. They believe that the size of the inner ear means that it could probably hear about as well as modern crocodiles, and the skull is on display at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History in Texas. But if you can't make it there, and you have a 3D printer, you can print out your own replica with the data from their paper, since they did a detailed CT scan of it. It might take a little finagling. Nice. Yeah. That'd be cool. Next, there's a Jurassic Park phenomenon, and we've discussed this with a few people on our show, but... The Globe and Mail discuss it in detail and about how it's impacting Canada, where there are now more full-time jobs related to studying dinosaurs, especially in Alberta. And many of the scientists are pretty young in their 30s. Quote, like the creatures they are unearthing, the scientists are more diverse and specialized now. Some look at dinosaurs not through a traditional geology-oriented lens, but as field biologists more interested in reconstructing ancient ecosystems than individual skeletons. Others are zeroing in on chemical and morphological details that shed new light on what dinosaurs ate, how they behaved, and what their development says about broader evolutionary questions, end quote. So now there's even an annual conference called the Mississauga Conference, which gathers the Canadian Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. There's still some barriers to entry in the paleontology field, for example, a lack of funding. But Dr. Philip J. Curry said he thinks Canada is entering a golden age in dinosaur studies. He said, quote, I think it's going to be unbelievable what we're going to see in the next 10 years in terms of the development of paleontology and dinosaurs in particular. End quote. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. We always love more interest in dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and their senses of smell. <laughs> That's probably not the most exciting thing, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but you get a wider variety of studies. Yeah, that's true. You get a little more depth that way. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Canada, there's a new Canadian set of dinosaur stamps, and the set is the second in the series called Dinos of Canada. Unlike the first set, only two of the five animals are actually dinosaurs, <laughs> so it's a little bit misleading. But at least there's two. Yeah, that's true. Not even half, though. Most of them aren't dinosaurs. The U.S. doesn't have any dinosaur stamps. None that we've heard of. <laughs> that's e true. Recently. I am enjoying all these Canadian government things, like the Canadian dinosaur coins and stamps and everything. So each stamp is a picture of a quote-unquote dinosaur reflected in the eye of another, and the eye it's reflected in is meant to be either the animal's predator or another of the same species, depending on the particular dinosaur and whether or not it would have had a lot of predators. If you buy the uncut press sheet, one of the stamps is aligned with the eye of a T-Rex that makes up the background for the sheet. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's uh, watching you. Yeah. Like I said, only two of the five are actually dinosaurs. And, quote, the first is... Acrotholus auditi, which roamed Alberta's badlands about 84 million years ago. The second, the small feathered Trudon inequalis, inhabited the same area some 9 million years later. End quote. So, two pretty good choices. Lesser known. They might have used up the more well known ones in the first five. <laughs> 
The other three that aren't dinosaurs are an elasmosaur, a dimetrodon, which it seems like just about everyone thinks of the dinosaur, but is actually a synapsid, and an extinct boar called Cyprotherium. If you're interested, you probably are Canadian, and you can buy the stamps directly from CanadaPost.ca. When we go to Canada, we should send out postcards with all those stamps. Yeah, it's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> We usually have high hopes for postcards, and then we end up finding them a year after we get back, though. But maybe this time will this be different. Time, yeah. <laughs> Next, thanks to Chris, who shared this one with us via Twitter. According to BBC, Dr. Hilary Ketchum from the Oxford Museum of Natural History is piecing together hundreds of bones of a plesiosaur nicknamed Eve. And this plesiosaur was found by amateur archaeologists who saw a piece of bone at the Must Farm Quarry, and it may be a new species. Conservator Juliet Hay removed mud from the skull with a scalpel, which I can only imagine how painstaking that would have been. And the skull went through a CT scanner to confirm whether or not it's a new species. And according to Juliet Hay, putting together all the bones is, quote, a bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle, but yeah. I imagine much harder. Yeah, for sure. There's no box to look at to see if you got it right. <laughs> yeah. There was another person in that article saying, like, after the results from the scanner, that would be like having a box to look at. Hmm. You'd see if there were big gaps in the pieces that you lined up or something. Yeah, something. Next in the news, there's a woman named Courtney Milan, who's an author and former lawyer. She submitted dinosaur emojis to the Unicode Consortium, and that's the group that controls all the emojis and I think basically all the letters and characters that are available on the internet, more or less. So according to Unicode.org, quote, Adding characters to an encoding standard involves a long formal process, which can take two years or more. Jeez. Quote. Yeah. And I've heard elsewhere that anybody really can submit new emojis, but you have to justify why you think it deserves a new emoji. And then I think you have to pay like a fee to get it in. And if you pay enough money, you can kind of grease the wheels a little bit. Hmm. I don't know about this Unicode. <laughs> yeah. But I guess Milan, being well-versed in law, didn't really see this as much of an obstacle. Her submission is really fun to read. The intro says, quote, The current selection of emoji animals is missing a vital portion of natural species. While there are alligators, koalas, mice, snakes, whales, and dragons, utterly missing from the emoji pantheon are any extinct creatures. Specifically, none of the prehistoric dinosaurs that have captured the human imagination and become a part of our global culture are present. This proposal details a set of Jurassic emoji to fix this situation once and for all. I propose three separate Jurassic emoji, formerly named T-Rex head, Bronto head, and Triceratops head. End quote. <laughs> they all look pretty cool, and they have very unique features to them. The T-Rex head is kind of green, and it's got really big spiky teeth like you'd expect in a caricature of a T-Rex. And then the brontosaurus head is like a little blue smiley <laughs> neck and head. And then the triceratops head is also kind of greenish, but unmistakably triceratopsy. And she notes that recent evidence supports use of the genus brontosaurus and that apatosaurus was never popularly used, which I think is a pretty fair statement because I was correcting people that brontosaurus wasn't a real dinosaur up until it became an established dinosaur genus again. She also points out that the word dinosaur appears more than twice as often as snake and more than four times as often as octopus if you do a book search in Amazon. So that shows that dinosaurs are a very popular thing in our culture and deserve some emojis. The submission continues for eight pages, and it's written pretty comically, <laughs> which makes me wonder how serious of a submission it is. How and, serious are emoji submissions in general? Yeah, though? maybe that's where she's coming from. And it has a lot of evidence for people's love of dinosaurs, including tons of quotes from people like, I can't believe there isn't a dinosaur emoji. And like, what am I supposed to do when I'm saying roar or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's pretty fun to read. Hopefully she'll get in there. I looked at the most recent list of emojis that are up for consideration and it hasn't been added yet. But she just submitted it, I think, like a month or two ago. And since apparently it can be a two-year process, who knows how long it takes. I wonder why it takes two years. I don't know. They do add tons of emojis all the time. 
And there are lots of other ones that are up for addition. Hopefully dinosaurs get in there. I saw a few responses where they said, what about like Plesiosaurus and Pliosaurus and like all these other ones? So maybe they'll get in there too. She started something. Yeah. Hopefully it doesn't snowball to a size where the Unicode consortium is like, oh no, there's way too many if we start going to prehistoric. We don't want to open that can of worms. Or they just do all prehistoric for the next couple years. Maybe it deserves its own little category. You know how they have the different categories? It should mm. be like a prehistoric one. That'd be cool. It would be. Next, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with zoos and museums. The Minnesota Zoo opened a new dinosaurs exhibit over Memorial Day weekend. And from now until Labor Day in early September, for $5 with your regular zoo admission, you can see 20 life-size animatronic dinosaurs that roar, move, and spit. One of them is an 18-foot or 5.5-meter-long 7,000-pound T-Rex. On Memorial Day Monday, the zoo placed dinosaur footprints in about a dozen locations around St. Paul and Minneapolis, including on beaches, walkways, and city streets as part of an eco-art display. If you see one, the zoo wants you to post pictures on social media using at MNZoo and the hashtag dinosaurs. According to Twin Cities Pioneer Press, quote, eco-art display is geared toward raising awareness of the zoo's mission to connect nature, people, and animals to save wildlife around the world. The story of the extinction of dinosaurs will be used to show what the zoo does to prevent extinction of other species, end quote. Good old Minnesota. Yeah. It's pretty cheap, five bucks. I don't know how much regular zoo admission is, although I imagine it's not too expensive. Probably five bucks. Could be. <laughs> I think that's about what it was last time I went to that zoo, like 15 years ago. Well, then it's probably a little more now. Five fifty. <laughs> Five seventy-five. <laughs> Next, the McClung Museum in Knoxville is hosting a summer dinosaur exhibit from June 4th to August 28th called Dinosaur Discoveries, Ancient Fossils, New Ideas. There's research from CT scans from New York's American Museum of Natural History, and the idea is to show how our understanding of dinosaurs has changed. And the museum will also have summer camps for kids. In the UK... Port Limpney Reserve is hosting a hashtag dino tour where they're taking one of their dinosaurs from the dinosaur forest on the road. If you spot their dinosaur, they ask you to tweet about it with the hashtag dino tour. The dinosaur forest has over 100 life-size anatomically correct dinosaurs, including T-Rex and Diplodocus. Tickets cost £25 for adults and £21 for children ages 3 to 15. If you're under 3, it's free. It's a lot more steep than Minnesota, but they're probably better dinosaurs. There's a hundred of them. Oh, yeah, and that. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a hundred before. That's a lot of animatronic dinosaurs. I don't think they're all animatronic. They're just anatomically correct. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. that's how they get you. Next, Movie Pilot is speculating that there will be dinosaur pets in Jurassic World 2. We tweeted about this earlier, and somebody retweeted us back with just all caps, No! Or maybe it was no. It's hard to tell. Colin Trevorrow hinted to Wired that dinosaurs may be trained the way Owen Grady was training the Velociraptors in Jurassic World. This movie is most likely not going to take place in a park. And Dr. Henry Wu, we know, got out at the end of Jurassic World with a case of embryos, which means we'll probably also see some new dinosaurs. Yeah, because it was that creation lab type place that he was taking them out of, right? Like the mm -hmm. Imagineer lab. Does that mean there'll be more Indominus Rex types? Could be. Yeah. I think it'd be kind of cool if people had pet dinosaurs that were like how people had pet birds <laughs> in like a similar way. Like they had a little tiny Gallimimus in a cage or something, maybe. But then knowing Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, they escape and attack you. Yeah. Claw at your face or something. They would be pretty awful pets, really. Yeah. Moving on. Last week, we mentioned Sorian's Kickstarter project, which we funded and which has already met its goal and is working on reaching a number of stretch goals where we're working on getting another interview with the team to talk more about the project. In the meantime, WCCF Tech breaks down the Saurian game and the stretch goals. Basically, in the game, you play as a dinosaur in an open-world survival game from hatchling to adult, so things kind of change as your character ages and you have to figure out new strategies. And the last couple stretch goals are VR support and console support, which would be cool, but not sure if they'll make it that far. Yeah, there's, they've still got a ways to go for those. They're doing very well, though. Yeah. I mean, they met their goal in like a day or two, so. Yeah. And last in the news, designer Janelle Becker is an artist who builds leather dinosaur skeleton models, which she calls Skelosaurs with <laughs> a Z. 
It took her three and a half years to design the models, and she's created a few different dinosaurs, including Trudon and Stegosaurus. And she recently ran a successful Kickstarter campaign where she raised over $20,000 of her $18,500 goal so that she can sell these dinosaur skeleton kits. And backers could pre-order kits for $50 each for T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, Brontosaurus. And kits come with all the leather pieces, metal clamps, a wooden forming tool, and a cork stand for the completed model. Becker said some models can be completed in as little as a half hour, which is kind of cool. Probably not by me, but maybe someone could finish it in a half hour. Yeah. That sounds a lot like the Kit Rex thing, but a little bit more interesting since it's... Leather? Yeah. Yeah. Probably more fun than just using cardboard. Yeah, classier. Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have another word from our sponsor... For you, the listeners of I Know Dino, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their audiobook collection. We recently published one of our dinosaur books, written and read by Sabrina on Audible. It's called What Happened to Brontosaurus, and you can get it for free. To download your free audiobook, you just go to audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino, and once you're there, you can search for Brontosaurus and find our book. Or if you're looking for something else, you might want to check out the book that I'm listening to right now, which is called The Dinosaur 4 by Jeff Jones, who we're hoping to interview on the show soon. It's definitely got some more serious themes, more like a Jurassic Park 2 situation. And it's definitely an exciting and clever book worth checking out. So if you'd like to check out The Dinosaur 4 or What Happened to Brontosaurus or How to Build a Dinosaur or just any audible book maybe you never read the lord of the rings series any book pretty much 180,000 of them they pick seem a book to have. any book yeah <laughs> they seem to have just about every book that i've looked for just go to audibletrial.com slash i know dino and you'll get a free book and we'll get the credit for sending you there and one other cool thing is that even if you cancel the service after getting your free book you'll be able to keep the book forever it's not like netflix or something where you only have access while you're subscribed you get to keep the books forever which is really nice it is nice and now on to our dinosaur of the day ornitholestes and that name means bird robber and ornitholestes was a small theropod it lived in the late jurassic in western laurasia which is now north america and henry fairfield osborne described the skeleton in 1903 it was the first theropod discovered in the 1900s the holotype was excavated by Peter Kaizen, Paul Miller, and Frederick Brewster Loomis. It's known from one partial skeleton with a crushed skull, which was found at the Bone Cabin Quarry in Wyoming near Medicine Bow in 1900. So the partial skeleton includes parts of the vertebral column, forelimbs, pelvis, and hind limbs. Later, there was an incomplete hand that was thought to be Ornitholestes, but is now considered to be Canicologrius. And that was found only a few hundred yards away from Ornitholestes, which is why the hand was assigned to it at first. The type species, and only species, is Ornitholestes hermini. And it's named after the American Museum of Natural History preparator Adam Herman, who directed the restoration and mounting of the skeleton. And Theodore Gill suggested the genus name. In 1920, Charles Gilmore said Ornitholestes was identical to Solaris, and in 1934, Oliver Perry Hay said there was only a difference at the species level and renamed Ornitholestes Solaris hermini. In 1980, though, John Ostrom revived the genus Ornitholestes. So Ornitholestes was bipedal, and it was a carnivore. It had a head proportionally smaller than most other carnivorous dinosaurs. It had a short snout and robust lower jaw. It had conical front teeth, and its back teeth were recurved and serrated, and Henry Osborne said that there were four teeth in the premaxilla. Gregory S. Paul in 1988, though, said the skull had only three remaining premaxillary teeth. It had large eye sockets that were more than 25% of the skull's length, and it may have used its big eyes to hunt at night. The small skull means it would have been difficult for it to catch prey with its mouth, so it probably used its arms. It had strong arms. It could tuck its hands close to its body, similar to the way a bird holds its wing. In 2006, Phil Center did a biomechanical study using Ornitholestes casts, the right forelimb, to figure out its range of motion, and found that it could swing in a 95-degree range and could bend its elbow at a 53-degree angle, which is more acute than Manoraptor forearms, which can bend their forearms to 90 degrees, but it's absent in primitive theropods like Coelophysis and Allosaurus. The forearm could not form a straight angle, so the forearm was permanently rotated upward. Hmm. And Ornitholestes may have used its forearms to grasp prey with both hands. Osborne described Ornitholestes as having, quote, rapid grasping power of hands and balancing power of its tail and large conical front teeth he saw as an adaptation to prey on contemporary birds. 
Then in 1917, Osborne suggested Ornitholestes was an early transition from carnivore to herbivore, but Charles Knight drew Ornitholestes chasing Archaeopteryx, and other illustrations like this have continued to appear. You can actually find that one on Wikimedia Commons. Paleo art is awesome. Yep, although that one will be marked as inaccurate. One of the reasons this is inaccurate is because Ornitholestes came from the western U.S. and Archaeopteryx is known from Central Europe. Yeah, that's a little ways away. Mm -hmm. Ornitholestes had a short body. It was about 6.6 feet or 2 meters long, and it weighed about 33 pounds or 15 kilograms. It may have eaten birds, fish, small vertebrates, mammals, lizards, frogs, salamanders, hatchling dinosaurs, or it could have gone after other small theropods. If it hunted in packs, they may have been able to prey on a juvenile Camptosaurus. It probably ate about 1.5 pounds or 700 grams of food a day, and it may have been prey for larger theropods such as Ceratosaurus and Allosaurus. It had a short S-shaped neck and a long whip-like tail that was over half the length of its body, and it had long forelimbs, about two-thirds the length of its hind legs. It had fairly short hind legs. Osborne calculated that the shin bone was only 70% as long as the thigh bone. The shin bone was missing. Ornitholestes is thought to be a fast runner, but the lower leg bone's thought to be shorter than the femur, so it probably didn't chase after other small dinosaurs. In 1969, John Ostrom said that the innermost toe, digit number 2, was larger than digits 3 and 4, and that digit 2 may have had a modified sickle claw, like Deinonychus, but digit 2 is in poor condition, so it's hard to know for sure. Ornitholestes is depicted as having a small crest on its snout. This is thought to be for display, but more recently, scientists think that now there was no crest. It has a broken bone near the nostril that seems to bulge upward, which made Gregory S. Paul think it had a nasal horn, quote, rather like a chicken's comb in looks, end quote, according to his Predatory Dinosaurs of the World in 1988. But in 2003, Oliver W. M. Rahut, and in 2005, Kenneth Carpenter, said it didn't have a nasal horn, but that the bulge was from the skull being crushed after the dinosaur died. Yeah, that always seems like such a difficult thing to tell yeah. if it grew that way or if it got squished that way after it was buried. Yeah. Percy Lowe said in 1944 that Ornitholestes may have had feathers because of Cenosauroteryx, a primitive silurosaur founded in 1996 that had fur-like feathers. Most paleontologists think all silurosaurs probably had some type of insulating feathers. John Foster in 2007 said Ornitholestes probably had more primitive feathers than birds, and it probably used it for insulation and possibly brooding eggs, and it would have covered most of the body. If Ornitholestes had feathers used for insulation, it probably had a fast metabolism and was pretty active. Because of its size, Ornitholestes was considered a silurosaur, but in 1986, Jacques Gauthier redefined silurosauria. Frederick von Huhn named the infraorder silurosauria in 1914. For a while, it was a tax and wastebasket for small theropods. But then in 1986, as I said, Jacques Gauthier redefined silurosauria. And in 1988, Gregory Paul said Ornitholestes had a similar skull to Proceratosaurus, which is a middle Jurassic theropod found in England, and he put the two together in Ornitholestinae, a subfamily of Allosauridae, but Protoceratosaurus is a Tyrannosaur, so this classification is untenable. Now Ornitholestes is considered a Silurosaurian, as defined by Gauthier, and some think it's the most primitive member of Manoraptora. The Silurosauria group is thought to be closer to birds than more primitive theropods such as Allosaurus. We've talked about Siluridae with Silurus in episode 56, and Silurosauria means hollow-tailed lizards. The clad includes theropods more closely related to birds than carnosaurs, and it, they may have appeared in the late Triassic, but many are known from the late Jurassic. Most feathered dinosaurs that were discovered are Silurosaurs. Silurosaurs have a sacrum, which is several vertebrae that attaches to the hips, which is longer than another dinosaur's, as well as a tail that stiffens towards the tip a bowed lower arm bone, and a tibia longer than the femur. And our fun fact of the day comes from all that talk about CT scanning we were doing earlier. Fossils are really the perfect candidates for CT scans, and I just went into a bit of a rabbit hole, so I wanted to share what I learned. So the full name of a CT scan is X-ray computed tomography, and it used to be known as CAT scanning, and there's lots of other names for it. It's essentially lots of high-powered X-rays taken in a row, one slice at a time as the object moves through the scanner, and tomography, the root of the word, comes from slice, so that's why. One issue with scanning people is that they need to stay very still, but what's more still than a fossil? Obviously, <laughs> fossils are a good choice. Also, increasing the X-ray power can increase the image quality, but it also increases the cancer risk. But since fossils can't get cancer, obviously that's a good choice too. 
and the London Natural History Museum published that they got down to three micrometers of resolution, which is one thirtieth of a human hair on fossils by cranking up the power. And CT scans are completely non-invasive and can tell the difference between materials with as little as a 1% difference in density, which can have some problems with people telling the difference between bone and cartilage. But theoretically, you could just scan a fossil while it's covered in plaster, and as long as the fossilized rock has a different enough density, you would be able to get the same result as if you had it perfectly smooth and uncovered. Maybe my favorite part, though, is that once it's scanned, it's very simple to make a 3D model with all the modern computing technology and 3D programming. So you can make a 3D model really easily, and then you can 3D print out as many copies as you want. It's still not quite as good of a 3D model as if you do traditional casting techniques, because 3D printing resolution still has its limits. But 3D printing is getting better all the time, and the number of materials you can make out of it are increasing too. You can even make a stone 3D printed model by doing CNC machining, and you can do metal and all sorts of plastics and stuff too, so it's pretty cool. And then obviously you can paint them. So if you have a favorite fossil, and you can find a scan of it published, and there are a lot of them out there, more and more of these... 3D CT scanned fossils are getting published, especially the ones that are in open access journals, then you can have it 3D printed out and you can have your very own copy of your favorite fossil, which is just awesome. It is. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, please check out our page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. We've been updating a lot more regularly lately. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.